So we're going to go over the second part of the questions and answer that they just released for us. And we're going to start with the first question on there. Now, the first question is, how big of a focus do you expect PvP to be? If I'm a PvE player, should I expect to be attacked by everyone I meet? Or do you expect PvP interactions to be few and far between as a PvE player? Now, the answer, essentially, it's an incredibly long answer here. I'm not going to read it for you. You can read it yourself. But it says, essentially, you're going to be PvP no matter what. So you can reduce your chances by going out to the wasteland, which is an area far away from any city. Now they also say if you're gonna stay closer to the city, you have a much higher probability of being PK'd, which I think is pretty cool because it's gonna make people move to areas to try and get out of the way. But they also state that you will not be safe from 100% PVP anywhere. You can be killed anywhere. So they also have, if you're absolutely against farming where someone can murder you, which if that's the case, honestly, I think you're playing the wrong game. They have solo instant dungeons, which will allow you to farm freely without worrying about getting killed in PvP. Now, the next question, who controls the PvP interactions? Is escape from an attack a viable strategy, or is it realistic to think that if we're attacked, that we have to fight back if we stand any chance to survive? And they say, uh, whether you engage in an attack or attempt to escape is entirely your choice. If you don't wish to engage in an attacking player, you will have all the tools you need to make your escape. Of course, not every escape effort will be successful. A lot depends on your gear, build, personal skill, and character class. If you're under attack with only 10% of your hit points, left it won't be easy to run from a fireball flying at your face i love how they put this because that's just what's going to happen if you think that you're going to survive or be able to run away at 10 percent health you're done like i'm going to be playing the infiltrator their our ability allows them to kill anybody under 20 percent health instantaneously so I'm hoping I catch some of these guys that are like, oh, I only have 10% of my health life. And I just go, bam, and they're done, you know? Because that's, that's the point of the game in my eyes. I mean, I know PvE is a huge portion and I will play a bunch of that as well, but I can't wait to just freely PK whoever I want. Now, next question. Have you finalized the guild size limit? And they say they haven't but they've been putting some tests together with the community and they're thinking about 50 member limit per guild, which is, it's a pretty sizable guild. You can respect that, right? Next question, are you able to explain what runes slash rune slots and enchantments do in this game? Are they a straight up stat boost or can they give you new effects? And they pretty much say enchantments are different types of bonuses that boost stat and grant certain minor effects. So they don't really answer the question. They pretty much say Brody yes to all of the above. Next question is, will we have a plus one, plus two, plus three, etc. enchantment upgrade system where you can have a chance of failing the enchantment upgrade? And they answer with enchantments will have a chance of failing. Now, this is good and this is bad. Um, I'm guessing the reason they did this is because it's going to be incredibly hard to get these enchantments in the first place so they don't want you getting discouraged by not being able to level them up in a certain way so they just give them to you right off the bat done which I can respect next question are the profession leaderboards only for the four crafting professions or are there leaderboards for the four gathering professions and maybe even the social professions? And they said each profession will have a leaderboard. Now remember, the social professions are hitman and sheriff. I'm kind of, uh, kind of excited to see a leaderboard for hitman. It's going to be pretty amazing. I'm guessing it's going to be, this is the guy that does the best, or this is the, the dude that has the most murders, and you need to go hunt him down. We'll see. Next, 
From what we have seen, backpack items are what determine your inventory size. Can one of the professions craft backpacks and are there different types of backpacks? Or do you have to buy them or find them? And they say you won't be able to craft backpacks, but there'll be different ways to get them. Merchants completing quests and from loot. Which is cool, I like the backpack system. Uh, it reminds me of a couple games that I've played in the past. Um, EverQuest, Ultima Online, Dark Age of Camelot, pretty much every single MMO had them. On to the next question. PvP, when you come into a battleground, can you pick what mode you're doing? Or is it random? And so, you know, you gotta capture the flag, hold the point, all those good things. And they say, you can join a queue for a specific mode, or you can do a random queue. And then they hook you up if you do random ones by giving you bonus experience and honor points, which incentivizes me to get better at PvP by just randomly queuing. Because you're gonna get better if you're randomly going into everything and just mastering everything. That's gonna make it out in the real world the ability to do better at multiple people jumping on you because you're gonna know how to take care of it because of these random modes you've been playing to get honor points. Next question, for PVP obtained artifacts and weapons, are stronger artifact weapons locked behind ELO rank brackets? For example, if I'm silver rank, do I have to achieve gold rank to unlock the ability to buy the next tier of PVP gear? And they say nothing is locked behind ranks. However, higher ranks give you more honor points. So if honor points are what you're using to buy things, you're gonna wanna get to a higher rank, make it easier. Next, are 1v1 and 2v2 arenas purely deathmatch, or are there modes with objectives in them? And they pretty much say, no. Deathmatch is last one standing on one of the team's wins. Then we got, will instanced PvP, so arenas, battlegrounds, those things, will they be cross-server? or you only gonna be able to queue against teams on your own server. And they go on to say, while the former is great in reducing queue time, the latter is much better at reinforcing the sense of community and at creative rivalry. The answer is arenas and battlegrounds will be cross servers, which I think is pretty cool because it will allow you to have faster queue times as well as the ability to just fight much bigger crowds of people that you might not meet in your world. Next question, are you able to inspect players while in the open world to see what they have equipped and such? And they said, yes, you'll be able to inspect players. However, you can turn this feature off because some of us don't want you to see what we have on. I'm guessing just in case we run into each other or I'm talking shit to you in town and I'm like, I'm gonna come out here, I'm gonna beat your ass and you come out and you think I got some pansy ass shit on because of the weird transmog that I'm using for my cosmetic look. And then I just pummel your ass and take some of your shit. Now, next question would be, have you considered implementing a PVE survival gauntlet for an example with a, a tower with a hundred floors to jump up? And they said uh, they're planning to implement it, but it does not exist at the moment, but there's a huge fan base for the style. Now, the I'm base. not a big fan of the towers. I personally think these tower designs are just laziness. It's just them saying, here's some filler. Here's all the monsters you've been fighting up to this level. And we're going to make it so if you try and fight a monster that you haven't fought at this level, you can't beat it. And I don't know. I've just stay. never been a big fan. They're going to have to incentivize it pretty heavily for me to want to actually go and play that. Otherwise, I think it's just a waste of time unless you're completely bored of the game and you have absolutely nothing else to do, then yeah, it can make sense. But at the moment, I hate those. Next question. We know you can gear yourself through PvP and PvE and crafting, but the legendary items for each paths, do they all exist? For example, if I only want to play PvP, do I have the opportunity of obtaining a legendary item 
or do I have to do a mix of the other two with it? And they said, you have a chance to get a legendary item from all three. However, none of them will be easy. Which I also like. That means you're going to have to do some work to get a legendary, and then you're going to know people that have them have put in the time. Next, can weapon items have class-specific skills on them? Or is it just common skills that every class can use? <clears throat> and it says, weapon items will have unique class-specific skills. This is a page right out of the Diablo book, where if you were playing a barbarian, you get tons of stuff that said necromancer only for the uh, skill that was on it. So it would make no sense as a barbarian to get one extra skeleton in your necromancer army. That kind of stuff, which is also pretty awesome. Now, I'm curious if this is going to be 100% RNG, or if you know if I go fight in this area, I'm going to get this kind of reward. I guess we'll find out, right? Next would be, are legendary items a stat boost above epic items, or do legendaries have unique effects to them instead of just a simple stat boost? And the response was, Legendary items will offer a stat boost beyond those of epic items. They will also have unique skills and effects. <clears throat> I mean, I think we talked about this in my uh, gear video because that's what makes a legendary a legendary is having the ability to use something that your character couldn't have gotten otherwise. So, like I said earlier, I think it would be sweet. Like, say a shaman. Right? Say you have the ability to stealth you and your pet because of a legendary item. That will make you a PvP god. But we don't know what's actually going to be on these items. Just, it was just an example, right? Because you'd, you'd think that would just make you absolutely unstoppable. Plus, plenty of other ways, plenty of other mechanics could help plenty of other classes. And, yeah. I'm excited for that portion of it. Then, continuing to speak on the legendary items, the question on everybody's mind was, are they gonna be fixed stats or is it still gonna be randomized? Because if it's a randomized stat on a legendary, that's gonna suck if it's that hard to get it and you bust your ass and then you have stats that don't do anything for you. But they respond with, thankfully, the legendaries will all be fixed stats, and they even throw in there, these are legendary items after all. So they get it. A legendary item, it, you're gonna know what stats it has on it before you ever go down the road of trying to get it. Now, I'm sure some will be quest-based. I'm not quite sure how the PvP legendaries are gonna work, unless they're just a ridiculous amount of honor points which then I'm going for that, you know? But they might have something else involved. They might have some sort of kill-death ratio. Who knows? It's gonna be, it's gonna be interesting to see how they implement that. <clears throat> then, question here. You confirmed in the past that it would be possible for players to obtain the best gear via crafting. However, normally, in order for the crafting professions to be profitable, most crafted items are bind on equip. If this is the case, does it mean that any player with enough money can acquire the best gear? And they essentially say the majority of the best items will not be tradable, right? You can't trade them anywhere. They'll be bound to the hero. However, there's this special crafting window that will allow you to hand over the materials and they have the ability to do crafting as the paid service by creating it and handing it back to you. But most of these require a recipe. And it says most recipes are bind on pickup, which means you can't get rid of them once you have them, they're yours. And some of them are very rare, making them highly profitable for their owners. The best crafted items, though, in the entire game will require players to farm bind on pickup resources. It's which locked. means if you want the best gear from crafting, you might as well start crafting now. Because you're going to use it later down the road. And hopefully, they're just as good as some of these legendary items to make you actually want to do it. Next, we have, for example, the Defender. 
Is his one-handed shield and one-handed sword one weapon type or two separate items? So can we equip a shield from something and a sword from something completely different or are they one? And they respond with, yes, they're both separate, which is also awesome because I'm sure there's going to be some amazing combos on that as well. Then we got, will randomly generated dungeons have fixed entrances in the world? Or do they randomly spawn? And they say, there'll be a bunch that are fixed and there'll be a bunch that randomly spawn, which another good thing, I like it. Now the random spawns, as always, will not continue to be random. People will know every single spot that they're gonna spawn because when they say random spawn, what are they saying? Three, four, five, maybe six spots is gonna spawn in an area. And I mean, if it's completely random across the world, that's gonna be nuts. Because who's gonna be able to track it down? There has to be some sort of rhyme or reason as to where they're gonna pop, or those dungeons will likely be forgotten about. At least in my mind. Next we've got, what's the party size in the open world? And of course we already knew it's four. And that was the speculation, and they confirmed that that is correct. However, you'll be able to gather a raid party, and they don't specify how many groups can be in a raid party, but you can build a raid party and take it around the open world, which is also amazing for mammoth open world bosses or open world PvP. I mean, good stuff. Then we got, can you get run over by a public transit? Now, surprisingly, this is a huge conversation one day in the Discord. And the answer is yes, <laughs> which I can't wait to see one of my buddies who are running across the train tracks trying to beat the train and he just gets smashed. <laughs> I can't wait. It's gonna be a great time. Then, moving along, if, for example, you chose the Alanian culture, are you able to obtain cosmetics from the other cultures? And they said, of course, they're never gonna keep any cosmetics from anyone. However, there is something that comes with the cultures and it's talked about in the next question, which is there is different skills that'll be coming from the different cultures to from each culture, unique skills on top of everything else you have, which is going to change your route of play on which culture you're gonna pick based more on those skills than on whatever cosmetics you were hoping to get. Cause I'm sure if you pick one, the cosmetics are gonna be cheaper in that one than they would be in another one, but you still be able to get them from the other one. I think it's pretty awesome. So now, you released some time ago, Lanians, Force King, and Ray Guns. Can we expect the same treatment for the three other factions soon? Moreover, could you share the reason why you stopped at Lanians and didn't follow the others? And they respond essentially with saying, what they've given us is incredibly little. There's various factions, secret societies, unique settlements, each with their own history, each with their own flavor. They wanna walk us through every single bit of this deep and rich history, taking a look at every single settlement. Now, the lore that they did share is just a tiny piece. And in the beta test, they say they're gonna show us much more of the Alanians and their culture, and then approaching the release, they're gonna start sharing some of the other ones, which I'm excited for because knowing that there's some skills, it's gonna, it's gonna definitely be awesome. Next question, is the sniper special skill totem more different in any way from the mystic profession wards? Does an example have a longer range to place the ward down? And they said, Obviously, a sniper's range to place the totem is going to be much greater than regular wards. Pretty simple and straightforward answer to what I consider a pretty simple question. That would be my guesstimate on that question, but you gotta ask because you never know. Now we got, does the sniper R reset the five shots counter he has access to before the 1.5 second reload happens, meaning you could potentially fire nine to ten shots without doing that reload? And they so. said, you immediately after using the R ability, he receives the maximum possible number of cartridges, which is five. And then if he runs out of ammo in this mode, 
then he will reload. Next we have, will we have titles in the game that we could obtain through several means? And they say, of course, you'll be able to unlock different titles. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a pretty straightforward answer as well. That's not a question I would have asked, considering every single MMO to date has titles. It just is, it gives you something else to run for that means absolutely nothing. So they can take another 10, 20 hours out of you, maybe 50 hours out of you for some title that doesn't cost them a damn thing. All they had to do was think up 10 letters, you know? And you're like, oh, fuck yeah, I'm gonna go after this thing. It's gonna be the greatest title. I can't wait till that's above my head. Do you know what happens after you get a title above your head? No matter what game, you Maybe get it for eight world. seconds. Different you're like, this is amazing. World, and then you're bored of it. And you're like, oh, well, why'd I waste that much time? It's just a title. <laughs> but they got that 50 hours out of you. <clears throat> Let's go on. For utility skills DNF, where do we get these skills from and how many do we have access to? From footage and screenshots, it seems there are only four different ones. This is when they get into the cultures having unique skills. They say there'll be 20 universal skills, 12 will be shared, and then one of each four cultures will have two unique skills. Now another question that that beckons right there is will you be able to get all eight of the culture skills? I doubt it, but maybe there's a way. I mean, you can do multiple talent trees and then swap them out, but you don't really keep the ability. So, I, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I guess we'll figure that out when the beta comes out. Next we have, will we have CC duration indicators? So as long as the CC effect lasts, which it's good to have in some games. In EverQuest, you had to guess it. You, you knew it was gonna be 10 seconds, but if the mob had a high enough resistance, it could be eight, it could be five. You were literally gambling the entire time. And I found that fun, but having a cooldown timer on the CC for when the mob was CC'd and to see how long they will be CC'd for, that was like Star Wars uh, Knights of the Old Republic, which was amazing. I don't think they brought it to Swoter, just in the Knights of the Old Republic back in the day on the Xbox. But still a great thing to have, allows you to plan your attack much better. Now my wonder is, does it work like EverQuest? If the mob's resistance is high enough, does that counter go from 10 seconds to 7 seconds? Simply because they resisted part of the spell, or part of the attack. I don't know. Another thing that I want to find out, and definitely curious. Then we have got, some of us discussed about the possibility of at least 6 classes with 18 specs available at launch. And then there's the ambitious kind of hype saying they're going to do 36 specs at launch, which would mean 12 classes. And they truly thought they could do 36, but now they see they won't be able to because that's incredibly ambitious. And they're focusing on the 18 specializations they have at the moment, which is it's completely fair. I'd rather they do it right than try and cram too much at us and then it fail right off the bat because they can't keep it up and running because there's too much shit in the code to not trip on itself. So, good call, I like that. Then we've got, is there a colorblind mode? And of course, there's gonna be a colorblind mode. And if there wasn't one in the game, there's one in Windows, which would take care of it anyway. So, wasn't really too concerned with that to begin with, but hey, it was one of the questions asked, so I'm gonna answer it for you guys and show you what's going on. Then we've got, will it be possible to change the view of our character's face to a passive skill icon as it was in the trailer? They say we're currently in the process of redesigning the interface, which you saw in the alpha gameplay video is not final. Only the mechanics of the passive skill will be displayed in the lower central portion of the HUD. The character's face will be moved elsewhere. Now it's pretty cool that they're redesigning the interface, 
but it was so clean already. I hope they don't vary too far. I hope they're redesigning it just to make it better and to make sure it doesn't run on your cores on your processor. So I don't know if you guys remember the MMO Terra back in the day when it came out. It was an action RPG MMO, uh, first person or third person, how you wanted to do it. Um, and that game was absolutely gorgeous. It was really fun to play and it had the potential to just go off and be the most amazing game now what happened was their ui was reflective right like it was like a mirror for what was behind you which is a great idea but it was just the borders that did it and they were really thin borders almost like they wanted them to look like they were metal and it was gorgeous now i had a powerhouse machine 10 years ago when that came out just insane amounts of power there was not a game on this planet that i couldn't run in 3d that's right i said 3d i dated myself to that old shit technology in 3d that i couldn't run at maximum 1080p graphics which was the best back then and i'd still be at 100 frames a second or more now terra which wasn't as good looking as some of those other games would lag down to 10 frames a second and it made no sense whatsoever and this plagued the entire game this happened for everybody there were people with ten thousand dollar machines getting 10 to 12 frames per second no one could figure it out until one guy did they messed up their code from the ground up now they couldn't go back because it was essentially the engine running the game the the main code the backbone so they'd have to redo the entire code for the game to get it out but the ui was incredibly taxing and it only utilized one core of your processor so it didn't care how many cores you had it would tie up the one core which would completely tie up your machine so you could hit the button to turn the hud off the ui off so it was just like picture mode and i'd have fraps running and i'd be over 200 frames a second and as soon as i turned it back on dropped to 10 which was so weird just because that little reflection they had in the ui and the game died because of it it literally died because of it so that's our uh, q a two a two here and overall I'm happy with how the game is coming together. I'm really happy how they seriously put some focus on the balance of people who like PvE and people who love PvP. Because, let's be honest, the game will have that much more of an adrenaline rush going to farm something that's close to a city. Which is probably going to drop the best stuff. Let's, let's not kid ourselves here. You know, and it's going to be okay in our party. We need someone who can handle, you know, being jumped real quick. Some sort of tank that's going to be able to taunt so they can't attack anybody else. Then some CC to stop some guys. And then it's going to take some skill as a party, some communication. And the communication is going to have to be incredibly fast. It's going to have to be something you've practiced, which is why I said earlier in those battlegrounds and those arenas, you're going to be able to practice for these moments as long as you're playing with friends who you're going to group up with because if you have everything moving right and you have the communication even if you are jumped and you're at 50 percent health if you know what the hell you're doing you might still win the fight even if it's a full group attacking you if you've got it down to a system and you know exactly how to attack what attacks to use and you complement each other Sky's the limit, guys. Sky is the limit. And it's up to us to try and figure out what that system is. And I, for one, can't wait. And as always, I'm Hells First. And until next time, ta-ta.